It's Easter weekend when we thank God that Jesus uh, died for our sins, the most amazing act of love in history. And we also celebrate his resurrection from the dead. Praise God he did not remain dead. And um, of course, Easter comes every year, so I preach on these topics every year. But also, this is the center truth of the Christian faith. So I actually talk about this a lot all throughout the year as well. And I was thinking about what specifically to speak about this year. And I thought about the fact that the cross leads to the Holy Spirit. And what prompted me to think about this aspect of the cross and this connection between the cross and the Holy Spirit is a verse from Zechariah. And that it's not surprising if you realize that I have been preaching through the book of Zechariah as part of a series on the minor prophets. So here's the verse that um, the Lord used to prompt me to um, focus on this topic this year uh, on uh, Easter weekend. So, so Zechariah 4.6. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will help us to see the connection between the cross and the Holy Spirit. I thank you that Jesus died for our sins and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness so that we can be a fit uh, place for the Holy Spirit to come and live and walk and shine through us and help us to think about these things and be encouraged and strengthened and guided by them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So uh, Zerubbabel was called to rebuild the temple, not by himself, but he was one of the people leading the process. Uh, the temple had been destroyed by Babylon, and, and, and now the people had been allowed to return to uh, Israel to Judah Ju to Jerusalem and and they were called to rebuild the temple and 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 also to help lead God's people in serving him uh, he, he was he was a leader of the people and in order to do this job he needed the Holy Spirit he needed the Holy Spirit to do this work in a way that would be effective and bear good fruit people can build buildings um, of course, in a way, we are dependent on God for everything. I mean, we didn't create the air we breathe. Uh, we didn't create our own brains or our own bodies. So, um, but, but we need the Holy Spirit in a more direct way if we're going to do anything that uh, will bear good fruit, fruit that lasts um, and that is going to be pleasing to God and that is going to make a difference uh, in eternity. Um, we see this here in Zechariah. Uh, it's not by Zerubbabel having a lot of worldly power or, or, or might, but it's by the Holy Spirit that he would be able to do this job that God was giving him. As something similar is said uh, in Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the gods stay and watch in vain. So if God is not helping us do something, then it's useless to do it. Um, it might seem like it works uh, in a temporary way in this world, but it's not going to have any good effect in the long run. We are totally dependent on the Lord, and the way he empowers us and helps us is through his Holy Spirit. Now this principle that we serve God by the Spirit, this applied to Jesus. We see this, for example, in Luke 4.14. Uh, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread through the whole countryside. Now, you might think, since Jesus was the Son of God and the second person of the Trinity, uh, God the Son, didn't he have his own power? And the answer is yes, but this, this is my understanding. And I admit there's some mystery here. Um, 
But I believe that when Jesus became a human and lived in this world, that he did not use his special God power, like his omniscience and his omnipotence. Um, even when he was doing miracles, even when he knew things that he couldn't naturally know, I think all of that was happening the same way that any other human being might occasionally uh, see miracles walked through them or might occasionally be given special revelation by God. I believe that all of this happened by the Holy Spirit walking in and through Jesus. He was being our example, and so he was totally dependent on the Holy Spirit the same way we are. He chose to be. I, I, I think that that is probably uh, the right way to to think uh, to think about it. Um, now, of course, because Jesus was perfect and his relationship with God was perfect, he never quenched the Holy Spirit even a little bit. He never grieved the Holy Spirit even a little bit. Uh, he had a fullness of the Holy Spirit and experienced the power of the Holy Spirit to a degree that uh, no other human being e ever has. Um, uh, nevertheless, it was the same basic thing going on in Jesus that can go on in our lives. We also see this in Acts chapter 10. Um, it says, you know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. So I believe that um, uh, even though Jesus is the Son of God, um, uh, I believe that he lived as a human being dependent on the Holy Spirit, dependent on his Heavenly Father who empowered him by the Holy Spirit in order to do all the good things he did, all of the miracles he did. Um, and, 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 and so I think uh, uh, Jesus also ministered uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, so this applied to Zerubbabel rebuilding the temple. It applied to Jesus in his ministry does this apply to us, and if so, how? I think you all already know the answer is yes, but uh, let's see one of many verses that point us in this direction. Here is um, the Great Commission. Now, the Great Commission, um, we usually think of, of, of um, the last chapter in Matthew when we think about the Great Commission, but the Great Commission is actually given in all four Gospels and also in the book of Acts. Jesus repeatedly during the 40-day period after his resurrection, um, gave the Great Commission in slightly different forms to his disciples. And here it is in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So we too can have the power of the Holy Spirit in order to do what? In order to serve God. The rest of the verse says, And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So God has given us this big job of making disciples. This is teamwork. Uh, different people on the team have different jobs. But together we are supposed to uh, share God's love and spread God's truth both locally to people across the street and also uh, far away uh, to different nations and different languages to people across the oceans. And we and we could never do this in a way that was effective, in a way that was fruitful, without the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, it does not depend on us having a lot of human power. It depends on us having Holy Spirit power. Now, what are some of the ways that the Holy Spirit helps us? I'm just going to give some examples. There are so many. And this is so encouraging. I pray that, the, that God will encourage you as you think about all of the ways that the Holy Spirit is able to help you live the life that God wants you to live. He gives us inner strength, Ephesians 3.16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. We need inner strength to keep going when it's hard, to keep serving when it's challenging, to, to, to not give in when there's opposition. Sometimes God asks us, to do things when we're tired, when we don't feel like it. And, 
And that's when we really realize that we need Holy Spirit in our strength. Praise God, he strengthens us by the Holy Spirit in our inner being. We need guidance. We need to know what to do, how to do it, when, where, with who. Um, uh, Romans 8.14 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Holy Spirit leads us in the life he wants us to live, in the walk he wants us to do. We need courage because there's a lot of opposition. The world is a dark, dangerous place. Um, it, it, it feels scary sometimes. And we can get courage from the Holy Spirit. Acts 4.31, after they prayed, uh, that's a good thing to do when you want more Holy Spirit uh, power and help is to pray. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So we have the Holy Spirit as Christians, but we're not always filled with the Spirit. But we should seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which means the Holy Spirit is controlling our whole life and influencing us completely. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Uh, that word boldly um, uh, often is used in a context where it means something like sp uh, uh, speaking God's truth clearly and openly without being influenced by the fear of people and how they might respond and what they might do or how they might try to attack or hurt us. We need Holy Spirit courage, and it's available. The Holy Spirit helps us by giving us spiritual gifts. Uh, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. So the Holy Spirit gives abilities, special abilities, things that people are especially good at to each Christian. And um, uh, I, many people, including myself, think that it, it's kind of like he gives us a mix of gifts. Um, I think most Christians have some gifting in more than one area. But I also think that most Christians have one gift that's their main gift, but they're the but they're the best at. And uh, God asks us to do things sometimes that we are not the best at. But, but most of the time, most of our ministry um, will be related to the spiritual gift that we are best at. So, for instance, it, 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 now it took me a little while in my life to figure this out. But um, my main spiritual gift is, 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 is teaching. Other people have spiritual gifts like serving, administration, uh, evangelism. There are many types of spiritual gifts. We need all of these, but this also reminds us that we need teamwork uh, because no person um, is, is, is intended to walk by themselves. We need the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit wants us to walk with people with different gifts, different abilities. And when we do, it's powerful. We need the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to kill sin in our life. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Uh, that's, that's talking about all these wrong desires we have. And if we just go along with that, it leads to death. But if by the Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can never do this without the Spirit's help. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Uh, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit helps us to put to death the sin in our life. Uh, we need the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So, uh, wow. Um, ha in order to do God's work effectively, um, we need to love our neighbor. We need to love other people with a Christ-like love. Of course, we also need to love God with all our um, heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, but we also need joy. Joy gives us strength. We need peace in the middle of battles. We need patience because uh, everybody is messed up. We're messed up. Other people are messed up. So we have to be patient with one another while we're ministering. We need to be kind and good and faithful and gentle. We need self-control. And these things also come from the Holy Spirit. And we need unity. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So the Holy Spirit helps us to walk together as a team and to keep unity. 
And uh, so, um, the Spirit gives us inner strength, guidance, courage, spiritual gifts, the ability to kill sin, the fruit of the Spirit, unity, and just in general, power to build up God's church. We need the Holy Spirit. Praise God, the Holy Spirit is available. We need the Holy Spirit for so many reasons. But what does this have to do with the events we remember at Easter with the cross and the resurrection? And the answer is everything. Now, I'm not going to be able to talk about all of the connections between the cross uh, and, and, and the resurrection. I'm not really going to have time to talk about that much. It's glorious, praise God, and it's important. Um, but I, I, I want in the rest of this message to help you see the connection. This is important. So now we're getting to uh, what the Lord kind of gave me as the main focus of this message is how the cross leads to us receiving and being empowered by the Holy Spirit to live the kind of life God wants us to live and to do the walk that God wants us to do. The cross and the resurrection lead to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost historically, but there is more to it. So, um, uh, Jesus is crucified, uh, and then he rises from the dead, um, and then 50 days later, uh, it, we see this in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the first followers. They get filled with Holy Spirit power, and they begin to do, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to do the job that God has given us to do. Now, each Christian receives the Holy Spirit when we are saved, uh, when we are born again, but we do need to continually seek uh, the empowering of the Holy Spirit by being filled with the Holy Spirit. So, um, so historically, the cross came before the Holy Spirit, but it's not just a coincidence that it comes in that order. In order to think about this, let's go back to the Old Testament. Now, um, I'm in a group of people who've been reading through the Bible together, and not that long ago, we were reading through Leviticus. And I'm going to be uh, honest, Leviticus is a difficult book to read through. It has a lot of details about different types of sacrifices and uh, laws and cleansing. Um, we don't do those types of sacrifices now, the animal sacrifices. And also it feels quite repetitive. But the book of Leviticus is powerful and it's there for a reason. One of the things we see in the book of Leviticus is that everything and everyone is sprinkled with blood for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, in the book of Leviticus, the word blood shows up 79 times. That's based on a word search of the NIV text. Uh, that uh, There's lots of ways to do this. I have a Bible computer program that does this very easily. Uh, so he real, God really wants to get in our mind that we need to be cleansed by blood. All this blood, of course, in Leviticus was the blood of animals, but all of it was looking forward to and symbolizing the fact that Jesus would shed his blood for us. Um, and, and, and in the book of Levitic, Leviticus, the blood is splashed, sprinkled, and splattered. I, I, was, I was talking about this with, with, with my mom uh, just recently because she's reading through, doing this reading program. And she was thinking about how messy this would be. And, and she was exactly right. This was messy. The cross was messy. It wasn't a neat thing. It would have been terrible to see Jesus being scourged in, 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 in the blood and, 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 and the suffering and the torn flesh and the blood. I mean, I don't want to get into the details, um, but it, it was very messy. And so it's, a pr it's appropriate that we understand the price that was paid for our sins. So there's this big emphasis on the blood, and the blood is there so that we can be forgiven for our sins. It is a sin offering. Uh, here's an example. This is this one little example from the book of Leviticus. Um, Leviticus 16, beginning in verse 14. He is to take some of the bull's blood 
and with his fingers sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Uh, then he shall sprinkle some of it with his fingers seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take his blood behind the cotton and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. And then continuing, in this way he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites. Whatever their sins have been, who praise God, whatever your sins have been, they can be forgiven because Jesus shed his blood. Jesus gave his life for you. Whatever their sins have, have been, he is to do the same thing for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So here's the issue. God is holy. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. So how can the Holy Spirit come and live inside of people who are sinful, who are defiled by sin? We need to be cleansed, and we are cleansed by blood, symbolically in the Old Testament by the blood of animals, but now we know that we are uh, cleansed because Jesus shed his blood for us, and when we believe him and trust in him, that is applied to our lives. So, um, with, we were thinking about the book of Leviticus, where everything and everyone is sprinkled with blood for the forgiveness of sins. Then God comes and is present in the tabernacle. Only after it's cleansed does God show up. Uh, and, and, and the same thing is true of our lives. The Holy Spirit comes and lives in us when we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Uh, looking back to when the tabernacle was built and dedicated in Exodus 40, 35, it says, Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when you get saved by believing in Jesus, uh, and then you are cleansed from your sins because he shed his blood for you, the Holy Spirit will come and will make your life something that glorifies God. Now, this also happened when they... So, the, so, so in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, they had like a temporary temple. It was like a movable temple, and this is called the tabernacle. Um, but after they settled in the land and, and, and they had Jerusalem, they built a permanent temple, which also was dedicated, which also had to be cleansed by these sacrifices. And the same thing happens in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10. When the priest came out of the holy place, so now they've already done the cleansing ceremony. The cloud filled the Lord's temple. And because of the cloud, the priests were not able to continue ministering. For the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Hallelujah. May the glory of the Lord fill our lives individually. And may the glory of the Lord fill the, the, the shorts that I serve and the shorts that you serve and worship in. Um, so God comes in his presence in the tabernacle after the sacrifice. His presence then guides his people through the wilderness and into the promised land. We see this in the rest of Numbers and then going through Deuteronomy and getting into the book of Joshua. Um, and um, so this is, this is history. Uh, it, it actually happened, but it is also foreshadowing. It's a picture of something greater. We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. You individually, if you are a Christian, are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says this um, because the temple is the place where God lives with people in a special way. But we are also a temple of the Holy Spirit um, as a group of Christians, uh, as churches. We are uh, not, and it's not the church building. It's, 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 it's when the people gather together. Now, we often gather together in a church building. Uh, that's fine. But it's the gathered people of God, the Holy Spirit comes. We are the place where God lives in a special way among people. Today, we are serving the function of the temple. Before God's glory fell on the tabernacle and later the temple, these things had to be cleansed with blood. The blood was symbolic of the death of Jesus. And it is his death that purifies us from sin and makes us a fitting place for the Holy Spirit to come and 
uh, live. Now, I want to emphasize that the blood was symbolic of the death of Jesus. Some, sometimes people have a hard time understanding this today. Um, it's not that there's something magical about blood, and it's not that blood has some chemical property that's good at cleaning things. It, it, if you really wanted to clean something, you should use water or soap and water. A blood would not be effective to do that at all. Um, you have to understand that when they were talking about shedding blood in the Bible days, it's not like they had the American Red Cross that would stick a little needle on your arm, draw out a, 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 a bag of blood, and, and, and then take it out. You might feel slightly lightheaded for a little bit, and then you'd be fine. That's not what they were talking about. They were talking about you bled and you died. The shedding of blood always points to death in the Bible. And so it's, it, it, it's another way of saying the death of Jesus. Remember, the wages of sin is death. And Jesus paid the price of, of, of our sin for us by dying. And a symbolic way of saying this is talking about his uh, blood. So the blood points to the death of Jesus. Jesus died for us on the cross. Now, this whole ideal that um, the tabernacle being cleansed is an image of what Jesus does for us today. This isn't something that um, I thought up on my own. We see this in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 9, beginning in verse 19. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of of hyssop and sprinkled the scroll in all the people. So the author of Hebrews, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is reminding of people during New Testament times and reminding us today of what happened back during the days of Moses and that everything had to be cleansed with blood. Even the people got sprinkled with blood. Um, okay, and then uh, continuing in verse 20, he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. And now we have a new covenant based on the blood of Jesus. Remember, in the Lord's Supper, Jesus says, this is my cup. Uh, this, um, this cup is the uh, cup of the new covenant, which is uh, in my blood, which is poured out for you. Uh, I might not have got that word for word correct. But the point is that we have a new covenant now based on the blood of Jesus. Okay, and then continuing, verse 21 and 22. In the same way, he sprinkled the blood, uh, with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. If you're going to be used by God to do God's work, you have to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Because without being cleansed by the blood of Jesus, you're not a, uh, a, a suitable place for the Holy Spirit to come and live. And without the Holy Spirit, you can't do anything worth squat. You are useless without the Holy Spirit. But praise God, you aren't useless when you trust in Jesus and you have the Holy Spirit. Verse 22, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Continuing verse 23, it was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified uh, with the sacrifices. So the copies, that was the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament, they were, they were purified with animal sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. That's, this is talking about Jesus now. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands. There was only a copy of the true one. The, 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 the temple, the tabernacle was uh, a copy uh, meant to show us symbolically where does God live? Uh, what's it in God's holiness, and God's grace, and, and how does God forgive sins? Um, but Jesus entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Um, nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all, at the culmination of the ages, to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. What a great act of love 
and he does away with our sin. That means he does away with the penalty of our sin. When you trust in him, uh, the penalty for your sin is paid, and he does away with the power of sin so that uh, you can uh, begin to be transformed and live a more pleasing life to God. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect in this life, but you're empowered, and, and, and you can become more and more like Jesus, and eventually to do away with all sin forever. Uh, when he comes back, there'll be no more sin. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus does away with sin. Continuing in Hebrews 9, 27, just as people are destined to die once, so unless Jesus comes back uh, before you die, you are going to die, and after that, to face judgment. Everybody is going to face judgment, and those who are not saved by Jesus um, are going to be uh, sentenced to the second death, to dying a second time. Verse 28, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. I pray that you will be among the many whose sins he takes away. And if you trust in him as your Lord and Savior and believe that he is Lord and that he died for your sins and that he rose again, then you will be saved. And he, and he will appeal a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So Jesus is going to come back and then uh, uh, we are going to be transformed and we'll never sin again. We'll never even want to sin again. And we're going to uh, be, have bodies that are incorruptible and immortal. We'll live forever. We'll never get sick. We'll be full of joy. We'll love each other. We'll love God. Hallelujah. In the meantime, we are waiting for him. Now, some people might imagine waiting as something you just sit back and not do anything. No, <laughs> uh, we have a lot to do. It's an active waiting. We see this in Second Peter as we get to the end of the message. Uh, this is the last verse we'll be looking at. As you look forward to the day, the day of Jesus coming back, as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, how do we speed the coming of the day of God? By doing our part to make disciples, to share his love, to spread his truth, to complete the Great Commission. How in the world can we do a job like that? Only with the power of the Holy Spirit. How can the Holy Spirit come and live in people who have sinned? And, and, and the answer is that we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. And then we are empowered to, uh, our sins are forgiven. And we are empowered to live the kind of life that God wants us to live and to do the work that he has called us to do. The cross leads to the Holy Spirit coming and being in our lives Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the greatest act that you gave your son to die for us, the greatest act of love ever. Thank you that you cleanse us from our sins and you forgive us. We would have no hope if you did not remove our sins. Thank you that as you cleanse us and forgive us, you also give us the Holy Spirit now, Lord, help us to live in a way that will allow us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and this power is available to us. Let us walk in this power so that we can live the kind of life you want us to live and do the things you want us to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.